Now here are some problems with valence bond theory. I know, right? It seems great. Why would we have any problems? Um, it has bonding schemes, it, it expresses bond strengths and bond length and bond rigidity with our single, double, and triple bonds. However, it still doesn't predict um, perfectly the magnetic behavior of oxygen diatomic. And so in addition, valence bond theory presumes our electrons are localized on the, in the orbitals and it doesn't account for delocalization, specifically resonance. Now, when we talk about molecular orbital theory enhancing these issues, we're not going to dive too far into molecular orbital theory um, for reasons being we just don't have a lot of time to do so, but also it's going to be represented for you in organic chemistry. Um, valence bond theory predicts many properties much better than Lewis, um, but again, some, some issues what molecular orbital theory can do for us is explain uh, electron delocalization. It applies the Schrodinger wave equation, which we talked about in quantum mechanics, um, to the molecule setting um, to calculate a set of molecular orbitals. So it is identifying that yes, when we have these orbital overlaps, whether they're the direct overlap or the parallel overlap, something happens to create a molecular orbital that we call sigma or pi. And so uh, the equation solution is estimated. You need a very, very big supercomputer to really understand the Schrodinger wave equation. And so there's a lot of math that goes behind this that we are not ready to handle yet in general chemistry. Um, you won't even be able to handle it really ready in uh, organic chemistry. You don't really get to the math and discuss it until you get into physical chemistry if you're lucky enough to take that class. It's an amazing class, very eye-opening, but it truly is one of those uh, classes that is um, uh, much later in your chemistry career. So in this treatment, the electrons belong to the whole molecule, so the orbitals belong to the whole molecule. And so there's really this idea that um, electrons are not localized, they're not staying put in an actual chemical bond, but rather they're, they're moving around the entire molecule itself. Um, from molecular orbital theory, what we have is the linear combination of atomic orbitals. The simplest thing that we can start with is this Venn diagram idea that when two atomic orbitals come together, like the S orbitals, they must create some sort of bonding orbital. We call that sigma, and we do notice that it is energy lowering, right? Overall, the energy difference between the atomic orbitals and the bonding orbital should be lowering. Now, every orbital has two ways to come together, in a constructive way or a destructive way. Just like when two things come together, they can be in phase or out of phase, what we have is a sigma bond, which is favorable. This is called a bonding orbital. We also have a way where they could possibly come together in an unfavorable way, what we call a sigma star. Notice that little star asterisk right there in that top right corner. This is an antibonding orbital. What we notice is that the energy difference that with the atomic orbitals and the antibonding orbital is the antibonding orbital is higher in energy. It's destructive. There's actually a node holding those two together. And so when we think about um, these two options, constructive and destructive, we get into the idea of molecular orbitals. When the wave functions combine constructively in phase, good. Yes, they result in a molecular orbital that has less energy than the original atomic orbital. We designate these sigma or pi. That's what we just described and we talked about and we mapped out in valence bond theory. Most of the electron density is held between the nuclei in those types of uh, bonds. 
Now, when wave functions combine destructively, the resulting molecular orbital has higher energy than the original atom. That's not good. We don't like that. We call these antibonding molecular orbitals. They're designated as sigma star or pi star. And most of these electrons um, are then outside of the internuclear axis. There's nodes between the nuclei. Why we have to account for these is so that we can truly understand why some atoms form molecules and why some other atoms do not form molecules. So when two atomic orbitals want to come together, they can be uh, destructive, which is the sigma star, or constructive, which is the sigma. What we want to relate that to is in bonding, the MOs are stabilizing. These are the atoms that actually exist. We'll talk about what that means. We'll go with simple ones, things like the diatomics. Why does H2 exist and not He2? Why does helium diatomic not exist? Well, it's because there are electrons in antibonding orbitals. And so therefore, it's destabilizing. The molecule won't want to form. What we want to be able to talk about here is bond order. Bond order is calculated here. One half of the number of bonding electrons minus the antibonding electrons. If we have a bond order of zero, the bond will not form. The molecule is going to stay as individual atoms, not ever form a molecule. If we have a bond order of one or greater, even plus one half, anything greater than zero, we will have an actual molecule be able to form. This is where we can start to identify in a molecule whether we have a paramagnetic or a diamagnetic molecule. Now we're going to see MO diagrams similar to what we had for atomic orbital diagrams, AO diagrams. We can look at molecular orbitals, sigmas, pi's, sigma stars, pi stars, and be able to say, let's build them up from the bottom, right? We'll off bow principle the, those, and we'll do Hund's rule, we'll do the poly exclusion principle, the exact same way that we built up our atomic orbital diagrams. We can do now with our molecular orbital diagrams. And now with this mo molecule, we can say, is it paramagnetic or diamagnetic? That will help us with our observations of things like oxygen diatomic. So when two atoms come together, we got one orbital on the left, one orbital on the right. We will always make two molecular orbitals, just like before, math. We put two in, we get two out. One is favorable, one is not favorable. And then we get to fill up from the bottom. Now this region right here is my new molecular orbital diagram, right? This is where I get to say, if I have two electrons, I get to start from the bottom and build up. Now I get to put two electrons in each. So I get to put my two electrons down at the bottom and nothing has to go in the antibonding orbital. I look at bond order for H2 and I say, there are two electrons in a bonding orbital this one, and I have no electrons in my antibonding orbital, and so two minus zero is two, multiplied by one half, the bond order for H2 is one. Therefore, H2 exists. So why doesn't He2 exist? Well, I still have the same sigma and the same sigma star, but now I have four electrons, one, two, three, four. So I start at the bottom, one, two. I gotta move up into the antibonding orbital. And therefore what I see is the bond order for helium diatomic is zero. So helium diatomic does not exist. Now, what about He2 plus one cation? We do know that alpha particles are really just He2 plus two. So He diatomic 
can technically form, but it has to be in a cation state. So let's see, would the plus one cation form? That would only be three electrons, one, two from one atom, and a third from an He plus one cation. We fill up our MO diagrams, we do our math. Yes, it exists. Just by having more bonding electrons than antibonding electrons, our molecules can exist. So the bond order is an important concept to be able to utilize so that when we look at um, a theoretical molecule, we can start to explain, does it exist or does it not exist? So MOs are a linear combination of atomic orbitals. The total number of MOs formed is always going to be equal by the number of a atomic orbitals that it actually came from. So if two atomic orbitals go in, two molecular orbitals have to come out. Um, when assigning the electrons of, the of a molecule to the MOs, we fill the lowest first off bow principle. We, we make sure we follow Hun's rule, right? With degenerate orbitals, we'll see those in a second. Um, and then we can also make sure we follow the Pauli exclusion principle with only two electrons in each MO. Now the bond order of a diatomic is the number of electrons in bonding minus the number of electrons in antibonding divided by two. Stable bonds require a positive bond order. More electrons in bonding MOs than in antibonding. Another way of being able to look at bond order is simply by understanding the number of bonds the two atoms made. So we can look at bond order for non-diatomic um, things. Uh, a single bond will always be a bond order of one. A double bond will be a bond order of two. A triple bond will be a bond order of three. When we want to use MO theory, we would use our, our math, right? If we wanted to just look at bond order, for um, a bigger molecule, molecular orbital theory is very complicated. So we can use this simplistic relationship. I wanna go through one more example of um, utilizing that MO diagram. Again, this MO diagram would be something that you would just have to fill in for. Now, H2 diatomic exists. What about H2 anion? Well, Hydrogen normally brings one electron to the table. What if one of those hydrogens was a hydrogen anion and brought two electrons? So we have three electrons total to fill up in the red portion of our MO diagram. Again, we start from the bottom. One, two. We got to move up to put that third one in the next orbital. Bond order would be one half two electrons in the bonding, one electron in the antibonding. Yeah, Hydra, hydrogen diatomic anion does exist. But guess what? It's weaker than the normal H2 diatomic molecule. Why? Because the bond order is lower. The higher the bond order, the stronger the molecule's bond is. Therefore, the more stable the molecule. Now, when we have other diatomic molecules, um, we can still uh, use the same S orbital to sigma bonding S orbitals and sigma star S orbitals. Um, these are the simplistic ways of viewing the MO diagrams. Um, we could have, though, an interaction of p orbitals. So when we get into the second row diatomics, such as carbons, nitrogens, oxygens, and fluorines, what we want to be able to imagine is a sigma bond created with two p orbitals. Um, again, there's a bonding and an antibonding in the 2px, the 2py, and the 2pz. So what actually happens is we create this beautiful molecular orbital diagram. You would not need to memorize this, but you should be able to identify here are our molecular orbitals. 
I'll highlight what atoms they're for. When we start looking at the atoms in the P block, now specifically, uh, notice the difference between moving from boron to nitrogen all the way over to the molecular orbitals of oxygen, fluorine, and neon diatomics. Notice the swap. Swap of the sigma and the pi. Now, again, you would not need to understand why that happens. You would just need to be able to fill this up and be able to explain, does the molecule exist? So here's where we start to look at our orbitals and our bond orders. All of these diatomics do technically exist. Boron diatomic, carbon diatomic, nitrogen diatomic, oxygen diatomic, fluorine diatomic, except for neon diatomic. Why does neon diatomic not exist? When we fill this whole orbital diagram, we see it ends up with a bond order of zero. And so MO theory is a much better way to organize our thoughts of looking at the expectations, does the molecule exist or not? And what does the molecule actually look like um, in three-dimensional space? How does the shape occur? This is where we will end our discussion of chapter six. Thank you so much.